1965, I enlisted in the United States Air Force, and after completing tech school at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, I was fortunate enough to be attached to the AFCS, Air Force Communications Service, for the duration of my single enlistment. I ended up working as a 30750 Tech Controller in Communications. This video is primarily about my second and last duty assignment at Diyarbakir Air Station, which was a remote radar site in Turkey near the city of Diyarbakir. It was located in the southeastern portion of Turkey in an area about one hour north of Syria. Originally, I was assigned to RAF Crowton in the United Kingdom, which was a U.S. military communications hub for most of Europe at that time. The base was located near the village of Crowton, which is near Oxford. The Crowton Communications Center in the 1960s controlled lots of high-frequency point-to-point radio, so locating the facility in the sparsely populated rolling hills of the Northlands was perfect for HF radio reception. Here's a picture of the Crowton receiver antenna farm taken at sunset. It consisted primarily of rhombic antennas as the HF circuits were expected to perform 24-7 on various frequencies on long-haul HF radio routes. This was RAF Crowton Tech Control in 1967. The controllers are utilizing teletype water wires to communicate with tech controllers at distant U.S. military stations, facilitating teletype and voice circuit repairs. The patch panels in the rear are DC teletype panels used for testing and rerouting teletype circuits. Ernie Wilson and John Nicholas, Willie and Nick, can be seen at the voice grade bandwidth audio boards at Crowton Tech Control. They would be coordinating operations on high frequency and undersea cables voice channels. After spending two years at RAF Crowton, I was starting to think that I was English. I was all settled in. I had a life. Then one day, totally out of the blue, I was told that there was a tech control force reallocation and I was going to Turkey. To Diyarbakir, a station that had seemed like tech control hell as described by those stationed there. As a controller in a plum assignment in England, I had previously laughed at my counterparts in remote Diyarbakir for being stuck in a one-year remote base like Diyarbakir. The change in my assignment struck me as more than a little ironic. So, the Air Force gave me a bunch of money and said, go to Diyarbakir and don't be late. So there I was, a pretty unseasoned 25-year-old, flying from London to Istanbul, spending the night and then taking a Turkish Airlines DC-3, complete with a Turkish lady who had chickens in a box and two pilots who argued throughout the entire flight on the leg to Diyarbakir. The pilots left the cockpit door open which swung back and forth while they argued. The Diyarbakir airport was my first sighting of the area and I was glad to see it. From the airport, an Air Force bus transported me to the air station where we were waved in by the ever-present Turkish guard and the ever-present Diyarbakir air station welcome sign with its somewhat whimsical claim of being the best in Turkey. The only place I ever saw the Turkish guards was at this gate and in their hut. Welcome home, airmen. The barracks at Diyarbakir were referred to as French barracks and were quite livable and bunked two to a room. I shared a room with a Philco Ford radio engineer named Bill Gaze, who was making the amazing salary of $32,000 a year untaxed with bennies, which for 1968 was more than outstanding. I think I was making 6000 a year as an E-5 staff sergeant. I remember two things about the barracks at Diyarbakir. One, you adjusted the air conditioning by opening or closing a big sliding flap on an air duct which had the capacity to cool sodas to near freezing. And two, because of the radar emissions from the site radar called Betty, there was so much RF radiation that you had to surround all stereo gear with grounded copper wire mesh called a Betty box or your stereo would buzz like crazy. The base dining hall served decent though not memorable meals. However, almost everyone at the base eventually contracted a condition called the turkey trots, 
an intestinal problem that caused me to lose 30 pounds before my year at the Abacur was over. A main entertainment feature of the base was the NCO Club, which is probably the drunkest place I had ever and will ever see. It was not unusual to see everyone from the lowliest airman all the way to First Sergeant Royce and his drunken boss, the base commander, whose name I can't remember, all blitzed out of their mind to the point of passing out, all present in the NCO Club on the same evening. The club used to book crazy British bands who traveled to Turkey in small utility vans and most amazingly Turkish female strippers who would probably cause the world to go into a religious crisis in today's environment. The NCO club had very little value except as a sort of a drug to keep all those young airmen doing something contained at Diabakur rather than seeking even more idiotic things to amuse themselves with elsewhere. The most striking facility at Diabakur was the dish antenna for the FPS-79 tracking radar, which spent its time tracking Russian missile launches from the Russian Kapustin Yar missile range, deorbiting material from those launches and items orbiting in deep space. This installation was affectionately referred to as Betty. Another striking feature of the air station were the twin 198 MHz radar antennas which were fed from an FPS-17 radar set oriented to monitor Russian missile launches from the USSR's Kapustin Yar missile launch range located near western Kazakhstan. The reflectors were 175 feet high, 110 feet wide. I once saw the radar set itself and what I remember is a very large RF tube encased in an industrial metal enclosure that might have been 10 to 15 feet tall. It seemed to be water-cooled and was definitely very impressive. The ANFPS-17 was rated at 1.5 million watts peak power and 155 kilowatts average power by the Lincoln Laboratory Journal on page 217. The FPS-17 radar set feeding the large fixed twin antennas was a very high-powered pulse compression radar set and is probably the source of the wah-wah sounding Betty interference that got into every audio device on the base. On this picture just above the building on the left you can see the feed horns which are coupling all the energy from the FPS-17 radar set into the very large reflectors for the radar signal trip to the Russian missile launch range and back. The Abaker Air Station was located near some of the 2011 current political hotspots of the Middle East. Site 106 was a small site near Diabakur that housed tropospheric scatter radio which carried circuits to the tropo site at Malacha and ultimately back to NORAD in the continental U.S. Site 106 also housed microwave radio and landlines for connectivity to the Diabakur Tech Control Center. Here is the Site 106 building showing one of the antenna reflectors oriented towards Malacha. A lot of importance was placed on Site 106 as shown by the placement of four AC electrical generators on the radio building marked by their four exhaust stacks. The two antennas and feed horns in Site 106 oriented to Malacha were mounted side by side. One antenna was polarized vertically and the other horizontally. I believe the tropo radio sets were rated as one kilowatt units. This picture is purposely color altered to provide a better view of the tropo feed horns in front of the dish antennas. This is a picture of yours truly at 26 years old being radiated senseless near the tropo antenna at site 106. These are two unknown U.S. Air Force radio techs on duty inside of Site 106 at Diabaker Air Station in 1968 or 69. Diabaker Air Station in the late 1960s, which was a remote tour, did not spend much time on spit and polish or the formal use of uniforms in the outlying sites like Site 106. It snowed at Diabaker Air Station in the winter of 1968-69. The station was located at the 2800 foot elevation and Diabaker was turned into a winter wonderland for a while. You can see the FRS-79 radar antenna in the background dressed in winter snow.
As most of the young airmen at Diabakur in the 1960s were basically bored out of their minds, there was no satellite, no internet, no TV, no pop radio, no females. So when the snow arrived, there was no other choice than to build a snowman. The final snowman product was left in front of the barracks for all to see. Also supplied was a snow hand that displayed a prominent middle finger that could be seen just to the right of the snowman. The usually drunken base commander insisted that it was offensive to his wife and demanded the removal of the finger in the morning. This is a little odd because his wife wasn't actually at the Abaker. Maybe he was confused and it was his Karahoni wife he spoke of. One day in the summer, one of the local Kurds came onto the air station and let people sit on his camel for 50 Karusa sitting. That would be yours truly as the rider, although you can note from the way I'm sitting on Mr. Camel that I wasn't totally comfortable with the possibility of Mr. Camel taking off and dashing across the Anatola Plains with me aboard. Yours truly again, now parked firmly on the camel, having finally reached enough confidence to actually sit correctly on the beast. Of all the pictures I brought back during my Air Force enlistment, this is the one my kids seem to like the best. Someone decided that we needed some local culture in our lives, so one evening a troupe of Kurdish folk dancers was hired to perform for us on the base. They sang in a style that you could hear on the local Turkish radio stations and they were actually quite good. Going into downtown Diyarbakir in 1968, was a real culture shock for young airmen who were raised on the Disneyland and Happy Days culture prevalent in America in the 1960s. Here's some Diabaker airmen walking through the city appearing as odd as spacemen from Mars. The ever-present bread vendor who delivered wonderful bread. The ever-present pistachio vendor. This guy was always downtown. The ever-present older Turkish man, complete with worry beads. The city of Diyarbakir is an ancient walled city on the Tigris River. The wall itself was restored in 349 AD by Constantius III of Rome. In 1968, the typical activity found in town might remind a person that they were still living in near-biblical times. The largely intact walls are quite visible on Google Earth. I found this vision of the ancient protective wall of Diyarbakir on the Tigris being decorated by an American mobile gas station sign to be at least somewhat amusing. One day someone booked a tour bus to visit various mosques in the area. One of the stops was a border crossing between Turkey and Syria. It's always seemed to me that as the tour bus contained about 40 USAF communications technicians, it's possible that the Russian KGB could have had a lot of debriefing fun with these guys. Here's three Syrian guards on the Turkey-Syrian border looking at a gaggle of U.S. airmen from Diyarbakir, many who held top secret with crypto clearances and had specific knowledge of crypto machines of the day, the KW-26s and KY-3s, as well as operational knowledge of the radar data collection and distribution methods at Diyarbakir. The Syrians failed to note who they were looking at, and everyone returned safely to DIY. So, it finally ended. My tour at Diyarbakir was up. My U.S. Air Force enlistment was up. The Air Force had offered me $15,000 to re-enlist. However, my next stop was the transition to being a civilian and off to college on the GI Bill. I said goodbye to all my friends at Diyarbakir, many who would soon depart from Turkey themselves. I departed out the same Diyarbakir gate which I had originally arrived at the air station, waving at the Turkish guard who was still standing guard at that gate. I was ready for the long bus trip back to the Diabakur airport, into the KC-141 Starlifter, and the trip back to California. I'll always remain grateful to the AFCS for providing the great communications education and the experiences of living overseas. I'll always remember my experiences at the 2130th Comm Squadron at RF Crowton in England and Death 75 in Diabakur, Turkey. Thank you, AFCS.